Good evening. How are you tonight? Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for coming out tonight. I, I want to get into the Word of God tonight real quickly and uh, just see how far we get in a couple of thoughts that I have. The, there are many things that, that God's Word has to say, and I want to go over a number of different things. Let, let me ask you a question. How many of you would say that you're really committed to your walk with God? Raise your hand if that's really true. You really are. Now, if that's so, I've discovered a couple of things that I think we have to look at. And because I've discovered also the things that go along with that, that there are some things that trip people up, that keep people from really experiencing what God has for them. And so tonight, I want to talk about those kinds of things. Psst, 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 excuse me. You looking for somebody? Well, I don't know where Tom's at. That's, he's at a meeting. That's okay. I'm sure that if he has an opportunity. Go ahead. Are you done? Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Folks, all I can tell you is that you either have a mother <laughs> or you've had one. It's one or the other. You have to take your pick. You, but, but both things that you realize is that you need to pray for me. <laughs> that, that is, and because there's many reasons but if you've, you have a mother, then you understand why you need to pray. But as I said tonight, if you're really committed to your relationship with God, then there are things that you need to realize and things that you need to either embrace in your life or exit out of your life. Those two things are really important to us. I've been thinking about this quite a bit. And as I've thought about it, I can't tell you that I've necessarily been very happy about what I've thought. But I can tell you that all of it is true. You and I live in a, in a society whether Christian or secular alike, that is a society that's built on a tremendous amount of relativity. Do you understand what relativity is? Relativity just means that at different times, different situations mean different things. That there is no more right, there's no more wrong, Situationally, right and wrong is decided by what happens. It's not that something is right or something is wrong. It becomes right or wrong based upon the situation that you face. Now, for some of you, you'll understand that and think about it as wondering why no one's ever spoken about it before. But for many of us, we, we actually think, well, what's wrong with that? Now, not only does that happen in our government and in our nation in this way, that we, we're having a really hard time deciding what's right and what's wrong in the country that we live in. We don't know if a death is a murder, it's a manslaughter, it's a accidental, it's that someone did something on purpose or they had a reason for it. We don't know about that. We can't tell whether that's right or wrong. We're having a difficult time describing the truth of all of that. Now, now, Chips worked in the 
in the court system for a long time. And Chip, have you seen kind of the blurriness of what happens, the difference between right and wrong, that right and wrong are no longer really being uh, emphasized? So, um, yeah, the, he said over the last 10 to 15 years, he, he, the reason why that he left the criminal justice system is because the laws have changed um, so rapidly in, in a decline, and we can't tell what's right. Ron, is that true or not true? Okay. Well, you know, these people are people who work inside the system. So they understand a little bit more about what we're talking about. But the reason why that I'm saying that it's relativism and relativity just so happens to mean that in one situation something may be right, but if something ever, someone else ever did it, it would be wrong. In uh, one of the things that we're religiously facing right now is that um, we face the difficulty of, of dealing with Islam while at the same time allowing Christians' heads to be cut off around the world with impunity, with just means that nothing's being said about it at all. And the reason why that it's like I, I'm just mentioning to you, the reason why that I'm saying this is not because of the government. It's not because of the laws. The reason why I'm saying this is because of the church world. Not because of the not because of the government world. So let me read to you a couple of things that I've written, and I believe that these things you'll find to be interesting. I I've just, as you know, I just came back um, late Monday night. Uh, I was in uh, Poland, and I didn't eat any kielbasa. <laughs> no pierogies. It's amazing. No punchkis. No sweets. Now, you know Jesus had me go there <laughs> because I had no other reason to be there but those those things and no dumplings it was it was horrible i did have a pork i did have a pork hock do you know what a pork hock is it's just got, yeah it's whatever it is it's just gross and it's got quite a bit of fat around it and then i had a a pork shank like we would have uh lamb shanks but i had pork shank but they don't have lamb they just have pork so they eat quite a bit of pork, very little chicken, hardly no beef at all. So um, I ate a lot of kapusta. Now let me tell you about kapusta. Kapusta is fried cabbage. Fried cabbage with, tastes actually really good. Fried cabbage with bacon in it. <laughs> Cooked or fried in bacon grease. Oh yeah. <laughs> I actually could have just drank the juice. It was just something, something else. But let's just say it like this. I had some time to think. You know, when all you have to eat is cabbage, then the rest of the time you can think about things. But let me ask you a couple of questions. And I, I just named this evening, I named it Facing the Giants. Have you ever sacrificed your integrity to get along with other people? To be accepted in a crowd of others? That you didn't want to rock the boat with people. So you just tried to be quiet and you thought it was godly if you were going to do that. Did you ever know that you had to chime in with somebody else or actually become criticized by them. So you just gave as little as possible so that you wouldn't be criticized. 
Think about the last week with people that have come in and out of your life. You've heard people gossiping. You did one of two things. Rarely a third. But did you agree with them in their gossiping? Did you begin to gossip too? Did you just say nothing? Did you hang out with someone that you know who didn't agree with what God has revealed to you from his word? Did you spend time with them, not realizing that they were pollinating you? Did you watch something, listen to something, read something that actually was to your own detriment? Because other people were doing it. And other people who were believers told you that it was okay. You knew it wasn't okay. But they kept telling you that it was okay. Ask yourself this question. When did I give up what was written? Because I just didn't want to fight anymore. I thought, oh, that wasn't so bad. Or did you stay away from God's word enough to where it wasn't bothering you anymore? Mom, could you please be quiet? Thank you. Okay. Because you didn't want to fight with anyone anymore. So you thought, you know what I'll do? I, I just won't deal with that. There's much confusion as it pertains to what our duty is. To either it, the Lord or to others. What is my duty to God? What is my duty to other people in life? I had the rare opportunity to watch a movie. I rarely, I don't like to watch movies. They take too much concentration. I like to click. <laughs> That's what I do. It doesn't matter. It could be at the height of the program when everything is supposed to happen. If my finger is wanting to move, I don't care. I just click. Anyway, it doesn't matter to me because clicking is my passion. <laughs> I have a clicking passion. But I had the rare opportunity to watch a movie on my return trip from Poland. I actually watched American Sniper. How many of you saw that movie, American Sniper? You know, that was the saddest movie I've ever seen in my life. But I've also never seen a truer movie either. It was really sad. And immediately my mind had nothing to do with the military. It had everything to do with the church. Because a man, I saw a man who lived his life with a deep sense of duty in the protection and in the preservation, preservation of others. Who only ended up losing his life, not by 
those he was sent to fight. But by one, he was sent to fight for. And at that particular moment, it became a microcosm to me of the way that you and I live and understand our lives every day. Whether you realize this or not, each and every one of us in this room, we do what we do for survival. We survive. Because we think that tomorrow is going to be a better day. It's going to be an easier day to deal with. That maybe things can turn around. While yet at the same time, we have to understand exactly what we face. Because the days we live in are not in the ascension of Christendom. They're in the descension. And if you're living in the descension of something, you need to know how to manage life even in a descending process. Whether it's your life, your health, your finances, anything about life, you need to learn how to be able to deal with it. Because your life is not going to be forever. Your marriage isn't going to be forever. You won't have your children at home forever. How are you going to handle living with that guy after they're gone? It's all kind of interesting. So the question that I have for us and that I came up with in my mind was, what is our basis of truth? I remember they brought Jesus to Pilate, and he, he's just going wild. He wants nothing to do with what's going on. Pilate, he is not interested in being involved in the situation that had anything to do with Jesus. He had already been warned by his wife. Listen, don't have anything to do with this righteous man. Don't have anything to do with him. Stay away from it. Don't get involved in it. Don't have anything to do with him at all. Stay out of this. This will not end good for you if you're involved. So he begins to ask Jesus questions. And as he's asking him questions, he's, he turns around and says, are you a king? And Jesus said, you said that I am. He said then, he said, but my kingdom is not of this world. For if it were, Mine would fight for me. But since I'm not of this world, it seems as though that others may be in control. And then he goes out in front of the Jews and everyone else. And he says, I find no fault in this man. I don't find, I don't want anything to do with it. They said, but remember, he just, he said he was a king and there is no king but Caesar. And now Pilate doesn't have any understanding and so he sees that there is the question of the divine that sits before him and his position in this world. And he turns around and he says he says to Jesus he said What is truth? What is it? And one of the things that we're missing as a generation is that we're missing 
a tremendous amount of understanding of what truth is. I've watched people over these years that I've found that they saw people as being true. That rarely did they make decisions that were based upon something that was the truth, but they actually made decisions on what they perceived might be a temporal truth. What are the things that are eternal? That in order for me to break into the divine, I saw a writing of one man who said these words. He said, how, how you live in Babylon will determine how you live in heaven. has nothing to do with your friends. It has nothing to do with the culture in which we live. It has everything to do with what you stand for. Not for what you compromise for. So what is the basis of truth? In John chapter 17, verse number 17, Jesus said these words in the Message Bible. He said, make them holy and consecrated with the truth. Your word is consecrating truth. The word consecrate is interesting because really it's, it's basically a religious word. Because consecration has to do with devotion and dedication. He said, Father, cause them to be dedicated to you by your truth. He said, your word is the truth. Cause them to be set apart for you by what you've said. The closer that you get to what he has said, the further you'll go away from some of the things that have tormented you. I want to use a word right now that I asked Amanda if she would pull up for me. And the word is syncretistic. Syncretistic is an interesting word, and I don't want to speak over your head. I don't want to do that. I already am. <laughs> but syncretistic just means take a look. That is not the definition I'm looking for. That's the one I'm looking for. Syncretism is a union or a fusion of different religions and cultures. That's syncretism or philosophies. That's syncretism. It's a mixture. It's a mixture of religions. It's a mixture of feelings. It's a mixture of philosophies. It's a mixture of different religions. How many of you remember in, in the book of Acts chapter 6 when they, were, when they were choosing the deacons to serve in the church? Remember, one of the deacons that they had chosen, whose name was Nicholas. If you remember Nicholas, Nicholas was an individual who, um, he was a pagan. He was just a pagan worshiper. They, they just worshipped whatever. They worshipped the rock. They worshipped the moon. They dedicated themselves to the sun. They had all of these things that they worshipped. Well, what happened was, was that he became a convert to Judaism. But many times you can get a guy out of paganism 
But a lot of times you can't get paganism out of him. So Nicholas went from paganism into Judaism, into Christianity. And what he did was he took all three of those things and he put them together. And when he put them together, it was called the doctrine of Nicolaitanism. Now remember what Jesus said about the Nicolaitans. He said that they had a doctrine that he hated. Because that doctrine was a doctrine where what they did was that they mixed things together. They mixed, well, that's not so bad, so it's okay. That's not really, well, that's not forbidden. I mean, God forgives everything, doesn't he? And what happens is, is that Nicholas sowed that doctrine to people and they believed it. And inside of the person's walk with God, they now found out that there were some things that they didn't have to do. Oh, you don't need to do this. You don't need to do that. No, you don't need to do that. Who said you had to do that? I mean, really. You know, come on. The Bible might say that, but it says other things too, you know. I mean, really. I mean, honestly, let's, let's just kind of like forget that, okay? And just bring it down and make it simple. God loves people and he wants them to say a prayer. Now, we, find, we don't find that prayer in the Bible, But part of the cultures that we've lived in have actually made that prayer really important. In the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, beginning with verse number 3, the Bible says, You therefore endure hardness. Everyone say hardness. hardness. He said, Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He said, No man that goes to war entangles himself with the affairs of this life. He said, no man. Everyone say, no man. No man. He said, no man that, that goes to war entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. That by entangling myself with things in this life, that all of a sudden, I stop being pleasing to the one who made me one of his soldiers. Now, the reason why that this becomes important is because, can you imagine that we would live our entire lives and come down to the end of life and find out that not anything we really did mattered? Remember, evil has nothing to give up. Evil always needs more. Righteousness is the only thing that has something to give up. So righteousness is the only thing it can compromise. Because evil doesn't compromise. Evil actually remains evil until what you do is that you give into it. And when you give into it, you think that what evil did was evil stopped in its forward progress towards something. But it didn't. Evil is an encroachment. How many of you have ever seen something that's called creeping bed grass? Did you ever see creeping bed grass? Raise your hand if you've seen creeping bed grass. Well, creeping bed grass is the reason for um, lawn edgers. You know where you go uh, by your sidewalk and you take the edger and you edge that? Well, um, originally, creeping bed grass could be grass that could keep its roots in the soil, but actually could come over onto the cement for quite a ways because it crept 
over the cement. It was uncanny the way that it could do what it did. But yet, the creeping bed grass is the same way evil is. Evil does what it does, line upon line, little by little. Compromise is never all at once. Compromise in our lives is little by little. Until one day what happens is is that you wake up and you wonder, how in the world did I ever get here? But remember what the Apostle Paul told Timothy. Now, one of the things you need to realize about the Apostle Paul was he was a person that fulfilled everything that the Jews said the truth really was. Where he diverted from where the Jews were was that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. That was where they, he had a breakage apart from where the Jews were. Now, the word entangles just means it's a braid. It's a twist. It's used of the Roman soldiers weaving the crown of thorns for Jesus. It's just an intertwining where that intertwining becomes something that you can't really tell which wire is which. That's the reason why that if you get a whole bunch of wires underneath a desk somewhere, you're almost better off by just cutting the wires apart because you just can't tell which wire goes where. And so they just cut them apart. But this inner weaving is the word entangling. He says they, what they did was they actually wove a crown of thorns to mock Jesus. It just means to intertwine. It means to interconnect closely so as to wrap and twist together and entwine, to entangle and finally be caught in it. He said, no man that wars, no man that goes to war, he ever gets himself tangled up with the things of this world because it ultimately will take him under. That instead of life becoming like you, you become like life. So what has occurred? We take this book and we take it out of the church. We throw it out. So what we do is we elude to a Bible verse somewhere. We say, I want to tell you a little story about Jesus when Jesus opened the eyes of the blind man. And then we go into something completely different. But one of the things, and even Linda and I were talking about it uh, today was that the greatest moments that you'll ever have in your life are the greatest moments that Jesus ever had in his life. When he said, it is written because it's what heals you, it's what delivers you. It's what makes you a worthy friend. It's what causes you to be faithful. Doesn't have anything to do with another person. It's got to do with you. I had the privilege to to talk this week, uh, this past week. Uh, I did seven or eight sessions on on, uh, marriage, divorce, and single, being single. They wanted all, all three of those subjects. And what I noticed was this, is people have a desire for you to tell someone else what to do. But the Bible's never written like that. The Bible is written to you about you. It's not written to you about someone else. It doesn't talk to you about what someone else needs to do. It talks to you and it is willing to give you all of the power that is necessary in order for you to be transformed. 
So just in case that someone else decides that what they want to do is to walk away from your commitments to you being what God has called you to be, the Bible tells you don't worry about it. As a matter of fact, a brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases because God has called us to peace. Because many times what we can do is that we can actually be more in, interested in an institution than we are for the reason of it. We're more interested in the subject of marriage than we are interested in the reason that we have it. We're more interested in the church world to be a, friend, to be a place where friends can get together than we are in a place where Jesus... the Holy Spirit and God the Father can be worshipped. Coming together is a celebration not of my friends. Coming together is a celebration of the redemption that God gave us. You see, everyone has in their life at all times, and this is something that you need to realize. Everyone has, and, and this is going to take me more than one week, as you can probably tell. And I may not talk to you about it anymore, even though it would take more than one week, because unless, it's, unless it can help you, it's tremendously helped me, then we won't discuss it. But I cannot live my life having not told you this. Because if, in fact, that you will be all that God wants you to be, then we must realize that there are just certain things that we must hold on to and certain things we must let go of. Everyone has in their lives at all times Goliath. Goliath is always in your life. Goliath will always be there. Goliath never goes away. He has a brother and a cousin. He's got, and, and all of them are named Goliath. You know, it's like George Foreman. He's got five boys, and they're all named George. George, yay, George. George and you, you, because you can never make a mistake about who he's talking to, because all of them are named George. So the same thing is true in life. You'll always have a Goliath. As soon as you get rid of one, he becomes bigger. And then you get to knock down a bigger one. And you knock down a bigger one. But what ends up happening is, is that you begin to get very confident over the fact that Goliath, although he becomes bigger, yet he's actually become smaller because you have become bigger. So Goliath is there all the time. Giants that are telling you that you cannot achieve what you were created to do. You'll never make it. You can't do it. These are the people of the land of you can't. They're all assigned to your life. You can't, you shouldn't, you won't. You'll see the people from you'll see land. You'll see. Oh yeah, you'll see. What do you want me to see? You'll see. I'm going, okay. What am I going to see? I want to see it. I need to see it because I'll tell you what. I figured it out that people want me to see what they don't, that they'll never see. Everyone has in their life also, they have Lucifer. Lucifer lives in your life at all times. Remember who Lucifer was. Those that are jealous of you and they want to be you. There are people that are still wishing that they were Hillary Clinton so they could have been married to Bill. <laughs> still. Still. It's really true. Monica Lewinsky comes out in her TED Talk in her first statement. She says this, that I, I made a great mistake. And my mistake was 
As a 23-year-old, I fell in love with my boss. And that's how she begins her speech. See, there's always somebody in your life that wants to be you. They want to get close to you so they can be you. They're not really looking to add value to your life. They're just looking to be you. Because they think if they can get close enough to you that other people will think that they are you. Lucifer is always there. You'll always have in your life Eve. She will always be there. Even if you're a woman, you've got Eve in your life. If you're a man, you've got Eve. If you're a woman, you have Eve. Because Eve is always part of everyone's life. Because here's who she is. There are those people that are called to help you. But they end up putting you in a place where you'll become unfaithful to what you know is right. That somehow circumstances, circumstances have a way of being able to, to be structured in a way that you can't get out of them. Someone who is called to help you actually put you in a place where you now have betrayed your own assignment. And in every one of these places, we can say, whether it be Goliath, I might have a giant in my life because I refuse to deal with something I should have dealt with a long time ago. He became Goliath in my life because I refused to deal with him when he was a midget. I'm dealing with Lucifer in my life. I'm dealing with Lucifer because I just believe that somehow, someway, someday, that person's going to be able to turn the corner. And when they turn the corner, everything's going to be great and they're going to be awesome. And everything is going to be just tremendous. I deal with Eve in my life. Because I'm called to to actually reward the improvement that I find in other people. And I'm having to weigh the difference in between. Somebody who's trying to make a shortcut... When there are no such things in life as shortcuts, there are none. But if you take a shortcut, when there are no shortcuts, everybody goes over the cliff that's riding in the car. Because there are no such things as shortcuts. And the Eve in your life wanted, wanted you to take a shortcut. And when Adam took the shortcut, you and I are still paying for it. We don't even know we could already be dead. We don't even know it. Every one of us have in our lives as well. We have Absalom. How many of you remember Absalom? You remember who Absalom was? It's a pretty interesting guy. Actually, Absalom was a guy that stood for what was right. He, he was a person who protected the honor of his sister when when her half-brother actually raped her. So Absalom became enraged. And instead of taking his half-brother to his dad and saying, look, this character, you know, he raped Dinah. He killed him instead. But the problem was, was that the Absaloms in your life were the people that you could love the most. They're the ones that actually, when you love somebody, they can do no wrong. But 
But if you don't love somebody, no matter what they do, they can't do any right. But Absalom's a kid that David loved. He loved him. He actually, even though he knew what Absalom was doing, he let Absalom do it anyway. Even to the point that David was run out of of the palace of being the king. All because he loved Absalom. And he wouldn't deal with him. Who's like that in your life? Everyone has in their life as well. Everyone has Ahithophel. Ahithophel is an interesting guy. As a matter of fact, Ahithophel was historically supposed to be Bathsheba's grandfather. So Ahithophel, he was David's friend. His closest confidant, who actually somehow, some way, he got sidetracked. And when he did, he sided with Absalom. Absalom said, tell me about my dad. What would cause him to do this and this? He said, how can I overtake the king? He said, well, if you do this, this is what the king is going to do tomorrow. At this particular time, he does this every day. At this particular time, you'll be able, he will be by himself and you'll be able to deal with everything. And Absalom gave him the answers to the king's life. And as, as soon as Ahithophel gave that advice to, to Absalom, he knew what he did was wrong. And when he did it, he ended up killing himself. David said in Psalm 55, verse number 20, speaking concerning Ahithophel, he said this. He said, in this, my best friend betrayed his best friends. His life betrayed his words. All my life, I've been charmed by his speech, never dreaming he'd turn on me. His words, which were music to my ears, turned to daggers in my heart. Pile your troubles on God's shoulders. He'll carry your load. He'll help you out. He'll never good, let good people topple into ruin. But you, God, will throw others into a muddy bog, cut the lifespan of assassins and traitors in half. And I trust in you. Every one of you has an Ahithophel in your life. Every one of us has a Judas. Everyone does. You either have one or you are one. Judas is those who would allow you to be destroyed to gain a better and less self-revealing deal. Because when Judas can point the finger somewhere else, no fingers come at him. Because he points all fingers in another direction. And Demas. Every one of us has a Demas in our lives. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 10, the Bible says this, Demas has abandoned me. He fell in love with this present world. Throughout Paul's life, Paul never veered from the vision that he had on the road to Damascus. 
He never gave in to the understanding that other people are like this. And because of that, he was going to stop what he was called to do. Before we close, I want to examine a verse. Go with me, please, to James chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. In James chapter 1, verse number 12, now remember who James was. James was the half-brother of Jesus. James was called James the Just. James the Just was actually uh, martyred. They threw him off the pinnacle of a temple, and he bounced on the ground and got up fine. And they ran down seeing that James had not died from being thrown off this, this tall building that they went down there and they stoned James to death. And that was actually James, how James, the half-brother of Jesus, died. But James had a revelation. And the revelation that James had was a revelation that, that he knew that this newfound church, that his brother, half-brother, died to redeem and bring his blood in order to sprinkle upon the mercy seat of heaven for the forgiveness of all mankind. James understood something. That even if in fact that I couldn't stop, or if he, even if Lucifer couldn't stop the redemption, he could confuse people into receiving it. And so James said this in James chapter 1, verse number 12. He said, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Verse 13. He said, Let no man say when he is tempted. Well, Let no man say when he's tempted. Was James talking about me being tempted to wanting to smoke cigarettes? Was he talking about me being tempted to commit adultery? Or was James actually talking about me being tempted to, to come off the purity of the word of God? You know, there are always excuses for everything that comes through our lives. We can find a way to justify anything that happens. We really can. We can find a way to justify people, situations, things we think that we see or things that we think we know. But James said in verse 13, he said, Let no man say when I'm tempted that I'm tempted of God. Well, really, what does this mean? Interestingly enough, what he's saying is this, is that no matter what you see, no matter who comes through your life, no matter what someone says, no matter what relativity, no matter what kind of things that are going on in society or culture, no matter what, don't ever think that God was the one that actually brought it and he wanted it to happen because he didn't. He said, let no man say that when I'm tempted to come off the purity of that which he has spoken, that God was the one who actually sent those things into our lives. Because we turn around and say many times, we say, well, maybe the Lord wanted it to be that way. Maybe God, maybe God allowed that. For that reason. No. He said let no man say. When he is tempted to come off of that which. He gave us. Of his teaching. 
that God was the one that called him to come off of that which was written. He said, because God cannot be tempted to come off those things. But God, would you just do this for me? Just He can't be tempted to come off of what he said. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must do what? Okay, so there isn't any begging. There's not anything I can do except use my faith. So he said, he said, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempts he any man. So, James chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, needs to be true for everyone. Their walk must be impervious to evil. The word impervious just means is that it cannot be touched. Like what was that in December of 2005 when the tsunami had come across Indonesia and, and parts of Asia there? A wall of water 26 feet tall. Anything that was 27 feet or taller never was touched by anything that happened in the tsunami. But everything underneath 26 feet actually was utterly destroyed. A man's walk must be impervious to evil. When the, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord does what? He raises it. That's why I began with asking you the question. Have you ever compromised your integrity? Have you ever tolerated things from other people? Things that actually somehow, some way got in your heart? Instead of strength as a believer, somehow, some way that there was something that was actually put in your life that made you question your faith, or what was written. So say this after me. I am blessed, I am blessed. Because, I because I endure temptation. For when I am tried, I, am tried. I shall receive the crown of life, crown which, the of life. which the Lord has promised to me because, because, I, love him. because I love him. I will never say, will never say that, when that when I am tempted to walk away from the word, away, even because of others, that it is the Lord who is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted to act on my behalf outside of his word. Neither does he tempt me to ignore what Father has said in order just to love others. In John chapter 8, verse number 29, Jesus said this, And he that sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. He said, for I always do those things that please him. In John chapter 5, verse number 30, the Bible says this, but I do, not, but I do nothing without consulting the Father. He said, I judge as I am told. And my judgment is absolutely just because it is according to the will of God who sent me. It is not merely my own. Over your lifetime, you're going to discover certain things. And it happens when you get, oh, somewhere in your late 30s and beyond. All of a sudden, because things have not worked the way that you thought that they should have been working. You begin to change what you believe. You begin to listen to things that will chip away at your faith. And the joy that you had at one time 
has now turned into mourning for the years that you gave up believing the crazy stuff that you had believed. But after I watched that movie, I thought about this. I thought about if not now, then when? If it's not you, if it's not me, then who will it be? You're the generation that's going to usher Jesus back in. But it won't be because we've compromised our way into the will of God. It will be because we're willing to shed all the things that have come against us and our faith. All faith must have, in the end of it, must have the freedom of all mankind. Freedom doesn't come just because we live in the American system. Because the people that are being attacked more than ever before in their own country are Americans. If you act un-American by being in America, then you can be protected. But if you act American in America, same thing is true with the church. If you act as a Christian inside the church, you can be attacked. But if you question, like unbelievers in the church, you can be appeased. Isn't it interesting how that the world and the church go hand in hand almost in anything that they do? Before we close tonight, I just want to ask you guys, um, I want to give you an opportunity to ask me anything about what I talked to you about tonight. Does anyone have a question about this evening? Someone has to have one. If you don't, then that I must have been so clear that you understood everything I said. But somehow, some way, I don't think that's exactly what Linda meant. Um, so does anyone have a question about anything? Do you understand what I'm talking about? You see, there's always a time to celebrate. There's always a time to run through a troop and leap over a wall. But there's also a time when what you need to do is you need to shut the doors and take inventory. How many of you, uh, you work at a place where they have like a day that you have to work because it's all inventory day? What you're going to do is you have inventory. Yeah, a number of us. We just have inventory. That's a, We're not doing business today. We're actually taking stock of the business we've already done. We're just going to check out and see all of those things. But my, my desire tonight was to, um, was for you to see that we live by a sense of duty. We don't live by our likes, by our dislikes. We don't allow a whole bunch of other things to come in and encroach upon our relationship with the Lord. The decisions are hard. Either way. Either way. Next week, I think I'm 
I'm going to talk about Ezra. Because Ezra was bringing the people back to God. But Ezra told them some very tough things. That if they really wanted the Lord, they were going to have to get rid of that syncretistic attitude. Picking up a few people along the way. And then just making sure that we do kind of things. You know, they, this is the kind of music that they like. This is the kind of stuff that they want. And we've given up all those things. And what did you get out of everything that you ever gave up? You didn't get anything. But did you lose something? That's the question. All right, enough of that. Enough of that. Enough of that. We'll shake it off.